Good evening. I hope you, you had your fill of soup and salad. It was delicious for whoever prepared that, we're grateful. I wanna welcome you all to Washington Memorial Chapel, the Episcopal Church at Valley Forge, for this year's uh, study of C.S. Lewis. And we're uh, blessed to have uh, Dr. Stuart Getz here at Washington Memorial Chapel and presenting to us tonight uh, based on the readings, I'm really looking forward to tonight's lesson. For those of you who haven't met Dr. Goetz, he is Emeritus Professor of Philosophy, uh, Philosophy at Ursinus over in Collegeville. He's also visiting scholar and uh, professor at St. Peter's College in Oxford. He is a, he's too humble to say this, but I'll say it, he's an expert in C.S. Lewis and uh, philosophy in general. He's written many, many books, so if you go and and do a Google search for books written by Dr. Getz, you'll find quite a few on C.S. Lewis, as well as uh, The Soul, and, and among other writings. So um, it is my privilege and honor to welcome Dr. Getz to the lectern for this evening's talk. Okay. Is, is that on? Is it? Say something. Say something. It, uh, yeah, I'm gonna say maybe I better move that up a little bit. It's set for my day, so I'd probably be better just without anything. Well, we want to hear you out on the uh, YouTube. Okay, that. how's that? I think that's better. We'll turn it up. Okay. No, I will. Yeah, I'll. I'll, I'll yeah, I just I might stay here. I don't know. Okay, uh, yes, yeah, C.S. Lewis, somebody asked me what's the title of the talk tonight, he said I have no idea. And it's uh, C.S. Lewis on the meaning of, of life. Uh, Gardner organizes these things and uh, Gardner wanted to include readings this year, so uh, we included the readings. And the first thing he said to me when I gave him the readings uh, was, uh, well, well, this isn't Winnie the Pooh. And I said, no, it's not Winnie the Pooh. And then somebody else said to me, well, Winnie the Pooh can be pretty deep. And I says, yeah, I suppose Winnie the Pooh can be pretty deep, but this is not Winnie uh, the Pooh. Uh, so I don't know how, how many, I'm just curious, how many of you actually read this? For tonight. Oh, look at that. Okay, that uh, some, some people uh, actually did read it. Uh, I asked Gardner, "What order should these be read in, or what's the the uh, sequence of thought?" And good old Gardner nailed it. He said, "He said, yeah, this is the first. This would be the free." You know, the order of, you know, sequence of thought. This would be the first one, that would be the second, that would be the last. Said, That's absolutely right. Uh, so the readings are on living in an atomic age. Uh, the second one's called Man and Rabbit. And the third one is uh, chapter eight from uh, the Great Divorce. Uh, so this isn't Winnie the Pooh. Uh, I don't know, when I give talks like this, if, uh, if it comes across as a little bit esoteric or difficult, you know, maybe that's the way it is. I once had a student sign up. I taught a course for 20 years, some years over here at her sinus, on the meaning of life. And uh, I go to Oxford every year. Uh, I, I, I co-lead a graduate seminar there on the meaning of life. It's a little, little different than what we did here at her sinus. But, uh, if you go to the Ursinus webpage, this is just a funny little story. Uh, they, they've had up there a picture of this former student. Uh, John, I can't remember what John's last name is. Anyway, he was a physics major at Ursinus. And then uh, he also was the center on the basketball team. And uh, John decided he would take the meaning of life. This is probably, you know, 15 years ago. And uh, he was there the first day. And I went through the syllabus, what we were going to be doing. And the next day I walked into class. Uh, there's John standing with a drop slip. 
And I said, well, what, what's, what's the deal? I knew John uh, just outside of class. He said, well, it was pretty evident from the first day that you actually expect us to do some work in this class. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, I guess I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that was the idea. And then uh, another guy, I mean, when you teach, it's, it's interesting what students come up with. So I'm just, another time, <laughs> I'm up front and this guy in the back row raises his hand and I'd just given back the exams. I know he'd gotten a D on the exam and uh, in front of the whole class he says, Prof? And I said, yes. Uh, he said, you know, I took this course thinking it was going to be a bunch of I'll just say BS. He says this in front of the whole class. It's going to be a bunch of BS. He said, this is the furthest thing from BS I've ever had. And I said, well, again, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, what, what, do you, what do you say to students uh, like that? So Lewis, I don't think, was a bunch of BS. Uh, he was an incredibly thoughtful guy. Uh, just a brief background, he was in Oxford from roughly, oh, 1918 to 1954-ish. Uh, he was actually a student there, and then he taught there. And then uh, about 55, he went over to Cambridge. So he spent his entire academic life in uh, Oxford and Cambridge. And uh, one of his most famous friends was a guy named J.R.R. Tolkien. And I thought I'd just read you, before we get into this, this. When you, uh, I, used, I found these downstairs, these are my bookmark. Uh, I think this is a good sense of uh, Lewis. Uh, there was a guy named George Sayer, S-A-Y-E-R. He was a student of Lewis's in the mid-1930s. And he recounted his first meeting with Lewis in Oxford. As he approached the door of Lewis's rooms in Maudlin College, uh, in those days most of these uh, profs were, uh, like Lewis, were bachelors, and they actually lived in the colleges. And, uh, and so you would go see your tutor, and Lewis was a tutor, in uh, his rooms, in this case he was at Maudlin College. As he approached the door to Lewis's rooms in Maudlin College, he came upon a man standing outside who was waiting to see Lewis. And I'm quoting now here, uh, literally here. Are you a, pu a pupil come for a tutorial, he asked. No, but Mr. Lewis is going to be my tutor next term. You're lucky to have him as your tutor, he said. As I walked away after the meeting with Lewis, I found the man that Lewis had called Tollers. That's Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien. I saw Tollers sitting on one of the stone steps in front of the arcade. How did you get on, he asked. Sayer, I think rather well. I think he will be the most interesting tutor to have. And this is Tolkien's response. Interesting. Yes, he's certainly that. You'll never get to the bottom of him. As best as we know, uh, Tolkien didn't have anything to do with philosophy. Uh, Lewis, although he took a position in English literature, uh, high criticism, English literature and criticism. Uh, Lewis had always wanted to be a tutor in philosophy and he couldn't get a job tutoring in philosophy. It's hard to get jobs in philosophy. Uh, uh, so he was, it was recommended to him that he get a, a, another degree in English, and which he did. And, but he was hired to, uh, by Maudlin College in 1925, uh, 
precisely because he could tutor both in philosophy and in uh, English. And indeed, when he started out, he tutored far more students in philosophy than he did uh, English. So the readings for tonight are pretty philosophical in nature. Uh, the first one we should look at is on living in an atomic age. Uh, Lewis wrote this uh, shortly after World War II, and uh, the America had used the atomic bomb, and uh, people were wondering uh, what it's like now to live in the atomic age. And Lewis wanted to make clear, oh, here comes my uh, wonderful daughter. Uh, and, uh, and he said, well, living in the atomic age doesn't really change anything about our predicament as human beings. Uh, all it does is perhaps raise the possibility of our being eliminated more quickly. But as a matter of fact, we knew all along we were going to die. So living in an atomic age really doesn't change uh, fundamentally the human situation. And I was reading, rereading this uh, to pick it for a reading, you know, for tonight. You know, I, I think of, uh, you know, we have all the, all the concerns about climate, and I was wondering what would Lewis say about concerns about climate, and I think Lewis would say, well, it doesn't fundamentally change the human predicament. Uh, we're all going to die anyway. Uh, perhaps, if you know anything about science, uh, you will just understand that according to science, he says, everything is going to wind down and uh, go into either a heat death or a, or a cold death, but uh, it, isn't going to, it isn't going to last. So that if we think about the implications of living in an atomic age or a uh, climate change age, Lewis's view, I think, would be uh, doesn't change anything about the human predicament. So he goes on to ask, well, how should we, with our knowledge of these things, how should it affect our lives? Uh, does it affect how we should live? And uh, Lewis, in on living in an atomic age considers two positions. Uh, one position he considers is what we'll just call materialism or naturalism. Philosophers try to distinguish between the two, but for our purposes tonight, we'll talk in terms of naturalism or materialism. And Lewis says, basically, uh, the materialist or the naturalist holds that uh, this world is all that there is. There's nothing beyond this world. This world, uh, according to the materialist, is thoroughgoing, uh, is completely material in nature. And every event that occurs in this material world is causally explicable in terms of another material event or events. If we have that view, he says, how should we live? So then we're going to assume now, says Lewis, we're naturalists, materialists. How, how should we live if this is the view of the world that we have? He says there's three possibilities. Uh, he says the first possibility is commit suicide. When I taught the meaning of life at Ursinus, I'd sometimes include a reading by uh, Camus uh, about myth of Sisyphus, and uh, Camus said, there's only one serious philosophical question. Only one, according to Camus, uh, if you're Camus bugs. Uh, 
why not commit suicide? Camus didn't commit suicide, but he thought that's the question we all have to face is why not? Again, given that we live in a, in a universe that's strictly material in nature, this is all that there is, there's no afterlife of any kind, first alternative is take your own life. Second possibility, says Lewis, is to grab all the pleasure you can get. St. Paul, I think, quoted a Greek thinker, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. Lewis says, well, the second alternative is just go for all the pleasure you can get because, in essence, there is no tomorrow. And uh, you might as well get as much as, of it as you can get right now. He said, you can do that in some sense for as long as you forget that you live in a naturalistic universe. He says, because if you do start and seriously think about the naturalistic view of the world, the materialistic view, he said it begins to infect your experience of the pleasures that you might have. Uh, if you start and think seriously that the pleasures that you have are no more than material events caused by other material events, they really don't have any purpose of any kind, they really aren't good. Uh, he said the second view uh, begins to lose some of its charm and you'll have a more difficult time living the type of life. Let's just get all that I can get right now. Third possibility, he says, is basically to define naturalism and choose to live a moral life. Bertrand Russell was a thinker, I'm sure Lewis read Russell. Uh, Russell wrote a famous essay called A Free Man's Worship. And uh, he wrote it early on in the 20th century. And uh, uh, Russell painted this picture, this naturalistic picture of the universe. Uh, we've come to be in a, in a universe that cares nothing about us. Uh, we're born into this universe uh, we will die, and it really doesn't make any difference how you live. Uh, you're going to end up, said Russell, the same way, whether you live a moral life or whether you lead uh, the like, kind of life suggested by alternative two, get all the good that you can have right now, even pursuing immoral means to get it. Uh, Russell said, bluntly, uh, the universe doesn't care a whit about us. But nevertheless, you might choose, as Russell recommended, you choose uh, to lead a moral life. And Russell admitted this could be a very discouraging life when you understand the universe doesn't care anything about you and you're gonna end up the same place as the person who doesn't uh, live a moral life, but lives an immoral life, you're just gonna end up dead. But then Lewis says, if you stop and think about it, why lead a moral life? Because the very standards of morality to which you appeal, Lewis says, in a naturalistic universe, those standards themselves are the result of arbitrary processes. Uh, the standards are not recognized by the material universe in which they arise. Uh, there's no reason whatsoever to think that these moral standards are true as opposed to false. They're just the result of atoms colliding in nature. And so there's really no good reason to be moral, uh, according to Lewis. 
And then he goes on in the atomic, uh, living in the atomic age, he says, if you stop and think about it, why even believe in naturalism? He says, people who believe in naturalism, that this world is all that there is, uh, they usually believe it on the basis of some argument. But Lewis says, if they do believe it on the basis of an argument, they're following rational processes, not material processes. And so the very belief in naturalism is itself a falsification of naturalism because it recognizes the reality of non-material, unnatural causes. And so Lewis says, if you stop and actually think about naturalism, you're gonna realize it can't be true on the basis of your reasoning. Uh, you can't come to the conclusion it's true. So what you're going to do is you're going to realize that uh, what you really are is something supernatural in nature. Uh, you are a being that's above nature. You're above the material world. He says in the reading, uh, you are a spirit or a soul. You're not a completely material being. And that's pretty much where the reading there ends. And so I then conjoined it with man and rabbit. Now in man and rabbit, uh, the assumption is basically you, you realize this naturalistic view of the world probably doesn't work, but you're interested in being moral. You want to live a moral life. And you begin to look at Christianity, says Lewis. And he starts out the piece uh, basically with a question, something like, uh, but can I live a moral life without believing in Christianity? And uh, Lewis says, oh, that's an odd. He's something just to be useful. You're interested in leading. Of course, people can lead moral lives without Christianity. But you would think, given that we actually desire to know the truth about things, uh, you would be interested in the truth of Christianity. Is it, not whether it's useful, he says, but is it true? And he says, the person who approaches it, Christianity now, considering does it help him, him or her lead a moral life, uh, Lewis says, you must think Christianity is principally about being moral. Why else would you be asking this peculiar question? Is it possible to be moral without Christianity? If you think the answer is no, you come to Christianity, you must be then thinking, well, it's going to help me be moral. Lewis is really odd kind of reasoning. But the assumption undergirding it, says Lewis, is you must think Christianity is about ultimately being moral. And he says, if that's the case, you have fundamentally misunderstood, misunderstood Christianity. Christianity actually maintains that is not the goal or the end of life. Morality is not the be-all, end-all. Indeed, he says, if Christianity is true, you were created for something else than morality. Uh, morality, in the end, will be swallowed up. It will disappear. But the real purpose for which you exist, according to Christianity, is something else. And Lewis believed, if you understand it, uh, the purpose according to Christianity of life, uh, the meaning of life, is to be happy. It's to be perfectly happy. Now, he knew that sounded strange to uh, modern, modern minds, people living in modernity, uh, but he said that's because 
people in modernity, you know, people today, they've lost touch with the real nature of Christianity, it was Lewis's view. Uh, if you go back and actually read which he did, he came to Christianity through reading uh, the church fathers, uh, philosophers uh, down through the ages, Boethius, Augustine, Aquinas, all these people. He said, you'll find they all maintained what Christianity is really about, the purpose of life in the end is we're created to be happy. And what people of a naturalist bent think they can do is they can somehow make themselves happy in this life. And Lewis's view was that this is a futile enterprise. Uh, nobody is able to make themselves happy with the kind of happiness that they deeply desire. He said that can only be done through uh, attachment to worship of God. So then I chose for the third reading, chapter eight out of uh, The Great Divorce. The Great Divorce is about, it's a story Lewis came up with one day, well, I think he, uh, well, he said he was in church. He got the idea to write The Great Divorce. I guess it must have been a terrible homily. Uh, so he's sitting there and this idea comes to him. I think this is what happened, uh, the, the great divorce. Uh, there was in, in the medieval times this uh, kind of story about uh, people who would be let out of hell for a day and basically ushered into heaven. And Lewis, takes this idea and uh, he situates it in the context of a bus trip. So the book starts with people lined up to get on this bus. And where they're headed is to the outskirts of heaven. And they get on, uh, Lewis now, it turns out this is a dream he's having, but the narrator uh, gets on the bus and heads off to the outskirts of heaven. And in chapter eight, uh, you have to understand that they're the solid people. The solid people are the inhabitants of heaven and the ghosts are the, uh, the visitors uh, from uh, hell. And Lewis is sitting there, he's the, uh, the person who's on the bus and he's, you know, he's experiencing, he's listening to all, eavesdropping and all these different conversations. And he, uh, he wonders, why aren't these ghosts being more, or the, uh, the solid people, why aren't they being more aggressive to come down? And basically, invite people to stay in heaven as opposed to getting back on the bus and returning to hell. And in the story, only one character stays. All the rest are going back to hell and Lewis is depicting their reasons why they're going back. Uh, but he says while he's sitting there thinking about this, he's wondering, well, is all this just this great way of tricking us into thinking that we really could stay when we really couldn't? Uh, are we just being duped by being invited here? Uh, is it all just kind of a charade? Is it a joke? Is it kind of like the naturalistic world? Uh, we've been led to believe we could stay up here in heaven, but we really can't, and these, pe these uh, solid people are just playing with us. He overhears a conversation of a woman uh, being pursued by one of the solid people, and uh, the woman keeps telling the solid person, leave me alone, just leave me alone. Uh, and the solid person's trying to say, but, but you really 
could stay. This isn't a joke. Uh, you really could stay if you wanted to. And the woman just keeps pushing back. She kind of gets close to maybe thinking about it, but then she pushes back. She says, no, I just want to be left alone. And the solid person uh, says to, to the, the, this woman, basically, well, if, if you could just forget about yourself for once in your life, uh, maybe you would actually stand a chance of staying here. That's, that's the idea. And Lewis believed that the only way to get happiness, health, uh, and this woman just can't forget about herself. But at one point, what are we made for? And the solid person says back, ah, you were made for infinite happiness. And so Lewis, in thinking about the meaning of life now, uh, if you live in a naturalistic world, you you know, have these kinds of choices before you, but every alternative you take, he thinks, is a dead end. It's not rationally justifiable. If you actually start to think about your rationality, your ability to reason, you're going to realize you don't live in a completely material universe. Uh, you are going to realize you don't live in a completely material universe. Uh, you, are, you are something immaterial. You are a spirit. Uh, that transcends nature. And then that raises the question, well, what are you for? And Lewis says, you might think uh, Christianity could provide some help because of morality. He says, no, 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 you've misunderstood Christianity. Christianity is not ultimately about morality. It's about being happy. And the only way you're going to get this kind of happiness is uh, through forgetting about your sinness is uh, through forgetting about yourself. Now, in the chapter 8 reading from The Great Divorce, he talks about uh, the Greek myth of uh, Tantalus, wherein the uh, gods punish this Greek character for uh, killing his son and then offering his son as a, as a sacrifice to the gods. And the gods uh, punish Tantalus for doing this. We, we get our word tantalizing from this character, Tantalus. And what they punish him with is, here's the punishment, uh, as I recall, uh, he wants to uh, drink, and so the gods hold out water there, but he can never get the water. Uh, and he wants to eat, and he can, the food's there, but every time he reaches out to get the food, he can't get the food. It's tantalizing, but he can never get it. And this is the punishment that the gods impose on this uh, figure. And so now I'm thinking about next week's reading. You know, here's the connection, uh, those of you who want to return. What I've given now for next week is a reading about a character called Sisyphus, whose name I mentioned earlier, okay? And Sisyphus was also punished by the gods. Uh, the Greeks had a good time thinking of the gods as these beings that impose punishments on human beings. And Sisyphus, his punishment is to basically roll a rock or a stone up a hill, okay? And the rock, the stone, whatever, rolls right back down. And he tries to roll the rock up again, rolls back down. Uh, he could never get the rock to stay on top of the hill. Now the Greeks puzzled over this for many different reasons, but one of the reasons they puzzled over it was what 
does it provide us in terms of perhaps insights into what life is all about? And uh, this reading I, I've give, I selected for next week is not by Lewis, uh, but it's about the myth of Sisyphus. And we're gonna, I'm going to try and tie it into uh, what Lewis thought about happiness, okay? Because it's one thing to say, well, we're created for infinite happiness. Uh, Lewis, the philosopher, would say, well, what you now must be, have to be asking yourself is what is happiness, okay? And so we're going to use the myth of Sisyphus in an article about it, uh, that I used every year in my class on the meaning of life. The students would, stand, you know, would sit there and they'd scratch their heads and uh, you know, try and figure this out. It's, it's, I, I guarantee you, it's really incredibly interesting uh, what this author has to say. And then I've got a chapter from Mere Christianity on uh, hope. And the, I'll tell you now, the connection between the chapter on hope and this reading, the reading's by a guy named Richard Taylor. He taught at Brown for years. Uh, Taylor in Rochester, University of Rochester. Uh, the, the, the connecting link when you look at this is going to be the notion of desire. So that uh, I think we don't live in a naturalistic universe. There's absolutely some rhyme or reason to why I picked uh, the readings that I picked and uh, we'll look at those two readings for next week. Now, just finally, and then I'm going to just throw it open for questions if you have any, uh, or comments. Maybe you're just sitting there and saying, this guy's a bleep. And uh, you know, the, you know, so there aren't any questions. There are just, this is what I think of you. OK, that's fair enough. Uh, when we're reading about next week, uh, one of the things we want to think about is, in the reading, uh, what makes life worth living? Okay, this week we kind of looked at what's the purpose of life. Uh, the, set, the guiding idea next week will be uh, more like what makes life worth living? And the two contrasting ideas that are going to be before you uh, are action. Does action make life worth living? Or passion. Does passion make life worth living? And then from there, we're going to go on to a third idea. In the last couple of weeks, we're going to go on to the idea of uh, do things ultimately make sense? So when people think about the meaning of life, uh, contrary to what my student thought, it isn't a bunch of BS. Uh, it's actually there's some guiding ideas in all this. Uh, the meaning of life, I told, I told the group last year, Meaning life, you're going to think about what's the purpose of life. You're going to think about what makes life worth living. And then thirdly, Lewis would tell us, uh, do things make sense? And we see that tonight in the living in the atomic age. Uh, Lewis thought the naturalist, materialist view, if you study it closely, it ultimately doesn't make sense. And people who are interested, seriously, in the meaning of life are interested in making sense out of things. Uh, what are human beings, anyway? One answer is they're beings who try to make sense out of things. What is it to be human? Ah, to be human is to be a being who tries to make sense out of things. 
Okay, I think I'm going to uh, stop there. Those of you who read the piece, uh, we just talked tonight, I should say. Uh, Tommy, you said, or Gardner, w w next week we'll actually just attach the readings because you had to sign up for them or something this, uh, this week, or I can't remember. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that, that sounds uh, reasonable. Uh, first question will be asked to me, do I have to read those things? No, uh, that, would be my, that would be my students. Do I have to read that? Uh, well, no, I suppose you don't have to read it. Uh, here's my question. Why did you take the course? Uh, you know, it's... Uh, well, I had to fulfill some requirements. Yeah, I thought so. That's, uh, yeah, that's why you took the course. You had to fulfill some requirements. So you're really not interested in the course. Uh, no. <laughs> One more story from Gardner. Uh, well, surely, Stu, you know, college students to take the meaning of life. You know, I'd say, oh, Gardner, don't overestimate uh, your college students. Uh, after the first week, I can tell out of a class of 25, I might have five students that are actually seriously interested in this. Uh, so do you have to read the attachments? Uh, no. But you might actually find them interesting <laughs> if you enjoy these types of things. Any comments or questions about what you're, those who read it for tonight? Those of you who didn't and want to fill in a any of the uh, gaps that I might have left, or something you might say, uh, guess you didn't mention that about the piece. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay, the question repeated. If I get this wrong, you tell me, okay? Uh, uh, how would you teach a generation of students or people who really aren't interested in the truth about C.S. Lewis? Some oh, so they are interested in the concept of truth. And they're not. So they're not interested in the concept of truth. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give you the, the Lewisian answer to that, okay? Uh, well, the, we, we live at a... I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, well, it's actually an interesting question because I think it raises the question, what's the purpose of college or higher ed? Okay, uh, it actually... Uh, it's a huge topic in our present day situation. Uh, what is the justification for higher ed. Uh, what is the justification for people who supposedly are not interested in truth? Uh, you go to college, how would you teach them this or anything else? Uh, Lewis's answer to that would have been, uh, they shouldn't be in college. Uh, Lewis's answer, and I speak with some authority, I just wrote a book, it just came out about three and a half months ago, in fact. I mean, this, this is a great question. I mean, uh, it's C.S. Lewis on higher education. I thought I might quote from it tonight. I didn't bring it to sell it, I don't do that. Uh, but, it, it, but it's entitled C.S. Lewis on Higher Education, The Pedagogy of pleasure. Uh, Lewis thought the reason you go to college or university is because you enjoy it for social political activism. Uh, Lewis's view was you go because you enjoy it so that 
if you're going for the right reason, it would be easy to teach these people because they are just interested in the truth because they get pleasure from thinking about these things and uh, there is no issue at that point. What we've done is, Lewis would say, we've created a situation in which we're telling the masses to go to college, to go to university, and now we've, we're indebting them. I just read today the average debt of a person going to college now is $37,000, and I believe that's just the student's debt, uh, what they don't actually factor into there, what parents are actually borrowing to send their kids to college. Uh, we're in a mess, uh, we all know it. Uh, Lewis thought the way out of this was, stop telling people to go to college. Uh, you go. If, if you're going for the right reason, you're going because you enjoy the life of the mind. And whether that be, I mean, our son, he loves mathematics and physics. I told uh, one of my children is here tonight, I told both of them, you know, we, my wife and I, you don't have to go to college if you don't want to. Uh, you go because you enjoy it. Our daughter is here. I'll never forget when she came home. Uh, she, uh, end of her, towards her, end of her sophomore year. Well, Dad, I had to pick a major. I said, yeah, that's usually what they make you do. Uh, what are you gonna major in? She looked at me and said, German. Next, I'll never forget, the next word was, what am I going to do with it? And I said, totally, totally wrong question. Totally wrong question, what are you going to do with it? Why are you majoring in German? Because I find it interesting. I enjoy it. I said, you will land on your feet. You will do something you love. And uh, if the world were the way it should be, uh, your question would have an obvious, easy answer. Uh, it doesn't have an easy answer because we have the majority of people going to college, they don't want to be there. Because they re think. Yeah. And college is a place where you're supposed to think. Anybody else? By the way, the reason why I wrote that book, is you, if you haven't had it, uh, is there was practically no one. I'd always tell my students, don't, don't go to generalizations, all or none or all that. Well, in this case, though, I said there are sometimes when you do generalize. People today looking to explain the purpose of higher education. I couldn't find one person before I published the book who was saying, the, you go into higher ed because you enjoy it. Every other explanation under the sun, nobody was saying this. So I decided, well, here's a guy who said it, so I'll, I'll put it out there. Anybody else? Why go into higher ed? Go to college? Oh, well, the first explanation is always to get a job. That's the most prevalent. Uh, I just read today, this will touch on the other, I think, major reason right now is uh, social activism. Uh, I mean, uh, it's a huge discussion in the culture today. Uh, an article came out today, I just saw, I try to track what's being written on this. Uh, a hundred profs at Yale have signed a statement that uh, the purpose of higher ed should just be the pursuit of truth. We should stop being social activists. We, you, you just go there for knowledge. That's the purpose of it. 
Uh, so not social activism, uh, but to pursue the truth. Now, the person who well, I think is most well known for just saying you go to pursue the truth was a guy named John Henry Newman. Newman lived in the 19th century, and he, uh, he wrote of something that's now known as the idea of the university. And uh, Newman's idea seems to have been uh, you just go just to know. It's, it's, that's a sufficient answer in and of itself. Uh, and most people thought that would have been Lewis's answer. Uh, it actually wasn't. Lewis, there is a piece where Lewis says, I don't agree with Newman about that. Uh, you go because you enjoy thinking and exploring ideas and discovery of truth. If you didn't get any enjoyment out of it, Lewis thought, what's the point of this? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. It's become a money-making industry too. I mean, there's no. I don't think there's any way to honestly deny that. I mean, what's fun for me? We're supposed to. When do we fly on? On the twenty-second of April or something like that. That, uh, to go back to England, uh, I run a graduate seminar there. I'll tell you, I would come back and tell my students every fall, uh, I just got back, and everybody who attended that seminar, we couldn't shut them up. I mean, they loved it, as opposed to, now again, I understand this is Oxford, uh, people there are they're incredibly motivated generally. Uh, not everybody, but uh, you actually find people who actually want to be there, you know. And then I'd walk into the classes over here, and I did have some good students, but the vast majority of them just didn't care. So you get different answers. Uh, somebody could say the truth. Uh, somebody could say, uh, I want to change culture, I want to change society, and this is the avenue with, through which I'm going to walk to do it. Uh, other people, it's to get a job. Uh, believe it or not, other justifications are the government needs workers. And uh, we send them into these disciplines because we have to, um, the government needs people uh, to fill its ranks. So you have a whole host of explanations for it. Yes. Yeah, it's a great little piece. Yeah, it is. It's a fascinating little piece. Yeah, I didn't walk through it because I thought I would put everybody to sleep. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, naturalism, uh, Lewis wrote a book called Miracles, and the central target in that book is something, he, he lived in a world that was, this was becoming the view, naturalism. And naturalism, philosophically now, is the view that any event that occurs in this world must have a, a completely materialistic or naturalistic explanation. Now, what that means, translate that out, is uh, 
every event in this world must be explicable in what we're going to call non-mental terms. So that we, in explaining an event in this world, we can't invoke anything that has to do with the mind. Because the mind is something, we call it a mind because it has mental capacities. And so that this, translate this way, any event that happens in this world must be completely, now emphasis on complete, completely explicable in terms that we find in ultimately physics, or if you want to step up a wrong chemistry or step up another wrong biology. But none of these disciplines will allow a mental explanation of an event. And the naturalist takes this thesis and philosophizes about it and now says, no event in this world, not only in biology, not only in chemistry, not only in physics, no event in this world can have a mental explanation. Lewis believed this early on in his life. And then he read some things that got him puzzling over. He, he had a tutor named a guy named Kurt Patrick, and Kurt Patrick was a thoroughgoing atheist. Uh, and he was inclined towards this naturalistic type view. Lewis thought, though, but why be a naturalist? He would ask, you know, he's thinking about, what, we want to ask people now, why are they naturalists? And he says, they reason themselves to the conclusion of naturalism, okay? But then Lewis said, well, but what is going on in reasoning? And Lewis thought, when we reason, we're using mental capacity now, and one mental event explains another mental event. So if you take logic and they teach you deductive forms of reasoning, you reason from premises to conclusions. And Lewis says, if you think about what's actually going on in an argument from premises to conclusions, you're apprehending now mentally the premises, and once you apprehend the premises, you're going to be caused by those apprehensions to reach a conclusion. And so that reasoning itself involves mental explanations. And because it involves mental explanations, it falsifies naturalism because naturalism won't allow a mental explanation of anything. And my students, seriously, they would look at me when you're trying to explain this. We didn't do this in the meaning of life, but I, I taught philosophy of mind, and we, we, we would go over this, and, they, and I'd say, oh, how do you make this relevant? To, I mean, how do you help them to try and understand this? And for years, I'm old enough to remember, there was a huge debate uh, probably back in the latter part of the 20th century, 1980s into the 90s, about something called intelligent design. I don't know if anybody here remembers this discussion about intelligent design. Can we teach in a biology class of a public school the idea that uh, maybe there are certain biological structures that are explained by a designer? And the, the answer to this was absolutely no. Now, what most, they, but they always framed it in, turn of, in terms of God. Well, you can't allow God into the biology classroom. But now, that really wasn't the issue. Uh, what kind of being do most people think of when they think of God? Uh, they think of a being that has mental capacities. Uh, it creates us for a purpose. And what 
was really at issue was can you allow any type of non any type of mental explanation into a biology classroom and the debate pretty much sorted out uh, no you can't the naturalist takes that idea and universalizes it we won't allow a mental explanation of anything so if naturalism's true I'm going to assume you came here tonight, at least you think you came here tonight, for a purpose. A purpose? Yeah, you might say, well, you came here in order to learn something about C.S. Lewis. Or you came here to get some soup. And he saw, there's a, there's a talk on C.S. Lewis. Well, maybe I'll hang around for that. But you came here, most of us, I'm, I'm going to do what I always told my students, I don't, all of us came here for a purpose tonight. Some of us might have come for one purpose, somebody else for a different purpose, but we came for a purpose. Naturalist says, no, uh, you did not come here for a purpose. Huh? what got me here tonight? Well, neurons firing, cross synapses, drove your body to be here tonight. Uh, but if naturalism's true, you didn't come here for a purpose. So naturalism is the thesis. We're interested in explaining things. That's basically what higher ed's doing. It's looking for explanations of things. Uh, the naturalist viewpoint and I, I, and be, uh, is that there can't be ultimately any mental explanations of anything. We'll use them as heuristic devices until we get to the real explanation, which is non-mental in nature. And you might say, oh, this is crazy stuff. Uh, well, I'm here to tell you, I've been involved in higher ed for my whole life, pretty much. Uh, naturalism is the reigning paradigm in higher education. Well, here's the way the naturalist justifies it. Whether you find this convincing or not, it's another matter, but here is the way the naturalist justifies it. We got here. We've reached tonight, okay? We're committed naturalist, so we can only allow certain kinds of explanation. Uh, if it's unlikely that we would have gotten here, well, the unlikely happened. That's the way the naturalist reasons it through. I thought you were going to say uh, mathematics. Uh, uh, mathematics is one thing that bothers naturalists because naturalists are beholden to, uh, to what we think of as science, the hard sciences. Uh, they think that's the paradigm from which they derive their naturalistic philosophy. But mathematics is an integral part of the hard sciences. And those who take mathematics seriously, I lived with one, was my son for years, uh, my, my uh, numbers bother these people uh, because numbers, there's a certain kind of necessity that goes with numbers and uh, you get into philosophy of mathematics. Uh, my son used to 
talked to me a little bit about this, and uh, he said, Dad, mo most mathematicians are Platonists. Uh, what that means is uh, they think numbers actually exist. Uh, logical rules of inference actually exist, and what we do is we apprehend these things. But they're not material in nature. You don't find them in this world. So uh, Plato argued that there is an immaterial world, a non-material world, in which all this abstract stuff literally exists and grounds our use, excuse me, our use of uh, mathematics and logic and, uh, and naturalists, they're honest about this part, they, they struggle with mathematics because uh, mathematics seems to be, in some sense, a thoroughly non-material discipline. Yeah, but, they, but they're going to try. Uh, whether one finds it convincing or not uh, is indifferent. But they're going to try and say, look, at, uh, we can't do science. Well, we can't get into this tonight, but this is going to be their argument, OK? Uh, we can't do science unless we assume uh, that no mental explanations of events are possible. So that's a pre, that's a methodological assumption to do science that they, we have to make. And the naturalist takes that, we couldn't do science without this assumption, universalizes it and says, well then uh, we have to go across the board, no mental explanations are possible. So there is an argument there. Uh, Lewis wrote his book, Miracles, because he thought uh, the argument didn't hold up, basically. Okay, uh, my wonderful wife is saying it's time. Uh, thanks. I really do. I mean, uh, next week, just give a shot on these readings if you're interested, and uh, we'll try and unpack them next week. So.